Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland. Today, I'm fired up. I've got another local guy. I love having local guys uh, on the podcast. I've got Colonel Scott Heathman. Scott, how are you doing today? Good. I'm doing great. Good. Happy. What day is it? I'm retired. I don't even know. Yeah, exactly. Every day, every day is Saturday. Every day is Saturday yeah. for you. Today, what is today, actually? It's Wednesday, it's, it's August. August 17th, yeah. right? That's the day it is. Well, hey, it's, it's so good to have you. You've got an amazing story, and uh, really look forward to sharing that with our listeners and our followers. Um, but just really the way I, and you've listened to some of the shows I know, so um, would like to really dive into really what's made you the man you are today. There's there's a lot there. I know that's a big question, a pretty loaded question to start with, yeah, but but yeah. there's a backstory there. So I'd love to start there if we can. Uh, well, I was born. Uh, that was a good thing. That's and, a great uh, thing. Always a great thing to be alive. And uh, I was born actually at Offutt Air Force Base. My dad was uh, drafted. And so that's where I, I, I came into this world. Uh, saw Star Wars at age three in 1977 you know so that put me on a track to i want to be a pilot you know and and wow. uh, so most of my childhood that was where my dream was and uh, eventually i uh, worked my way to rotc up in chicago at illinois tech right okay. on the south side of chicago and uh, got a pilot slot and uh, flew for most of my career uh, in the air force and i've had uh, a number of jobs in the air force uh, and a lot of leadership jobs here in the last probably 10 years, command jobs. Yeah. Uh, and then literally just retired just a few weeks ago. July 15th yeah. was our ceremony. And John Michelle, who you know, yeah. uh, he officiated, did a fantastic job. It was very comical, exactly like I wanted it. <laughs> High energy John that oh he is, gosh. right? Yeah, he hit it out of the park. And uh, and we've been traveling ever since, you know, all summer just being on terminal leave. And, yeah. and uh, now I'm trying to uh, start a coaching and leadership business. I'm yeah. like, you know what? I want another challenge. And so I'm starting from the ground up again yeah. and, and enjoying it. So. Well, you think about what you've been through your careers. How long were you in the military? Just over 25 years. Okay, so 25 years. I mean, you've learned a, a ton about leadership and you've had great little, leaders. Little. Yeah, just yeah, a little yeah. bit, right? And yeah, so absolutely, that, that seems like to make a lot of sense. Um, and I saw that your leadership mantra, which I loved, was be present, be bold, be innovative. Yeah. So when I, you hear that, what's what's that mean to you? I actually, I, I talked about this during the retirement ceremony. I, I that was the hardest speech to write because, you know, you can go so many different ways with a retirement speech. You can start pointing at people, or I, and I always like a talk where I learn something. And so I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll tell people what I've been about these twenty five years. Now that mantra really didn't come. I would say into my public vision until maybe at my 12, 13 year point in my career when I was starting to really take on some heavy uh, leadership uh, responsibilities. But uh, for me, um, it really breaks down in kind of three areas that I find myself ebbing and flowing throughout any given day, any given week, any given month. Um, they're not all balanced. Um, but there are three important areas that kind of guided my leadership. And, and when I became a squadron commander, I'd laid it out on a mug. And once you do that, if you put it on the mug, it's for real. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, so to me, being present was always about more than just passing people in the hallway and saying, what's up? Or just showing up to a meeting on time. It was about bringing your full self. Doesn't mean your best self, but at least your full self. Yep. You may not have a hundred percent in the tank that day. Um, but you're still bringing your full self to, to your day. Um, you know, it, it's maybe diving a little bit deeper with people. And I learned this from Cy Wakeman, who I'm a huge fan of. And she says, instead of saying what's up to people, she says, try asking people, what's your update? Hmm. Like, so on a Wednesday, ask somebody, give me an update today. What's going on with you? That is ingenious. Yeah. You know, it gets the conversation flowing. Well, absolutely it does, right? Because you're not just going to be like, yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, yes. That's the go-to, right? You actually get into a detailed conversation. Absolutely. It's understanding maybe if, you know, the times where I've been at the head of the table and I've had my commanders and leaders and experts around the table, it's, it's understanding everybody's learning style or which ones are introverts and extroverts and how do I manage a meeting in such a way that I can keep them all included in the conversation and not let any one personality dominate maybe a certain decision. So to me, that presence is about not only understanding my needs, it's more so about understanding yeah. their needs and what we're going after, you know. Yeah. Um, being bold, uh, I've been underestimated most of my life. Now, being five foot six, 
you tend to get underestimated <laughs> a lot. And, and I do know I've got kind of young boy looks. I, General Michelle pointed that out during my retirement. I think he called me major, boy major or something like that. <laughs> um, you know, and it, it's good in some things, but it is something that people have brought up. And I think, you know, when you meet somebody who's six foot five and, and has a look about yeah. them, you treat them a little differently. So to me about being bold was not only internally finding ways to maybe stretch myself in a way that I haven't done before, push the envelope of staying curious. That was always the go-to is mm-hmm. if in doubt, just be curious, ask questions. You know, because the best decisions, if you want the best decisions, you need to ask better questions. Don't just rely on data, but actually ask the questions, get the context of what's going on. And so I've always tried to push the envelope in my personal self because I've always been at, it has felt like to me at times at a disadvantage. So I've got to find other ways to maneuver. And it might take some good old fashioned boldness to maybe bring somebody into my network or say I'm not the expert in this and be vulnerable enough as a leader to just say, hey, I, I don't know all this. Um, can you, do you mind running this conversation? Because you seem to have, you know, the expertise here. I think not only one does that really make people feel good that you've empowered them, but two, it shows everybody at the table, you're the kind of leader that's actually open. Yeah. And you're going to create that level of trust, which is really what we're all after. Um, I don't ask, I don't tell people you need to earn my trust. I tell people you have it from day one. Um, you can lose it. Now there, yeah, there, are, there are situations out there, but I just, I've always succumbed to the philosophy that you don't need to earn it with me. You have it. I will give it to you from day one. I respect you that much. Uh, being innovative. Um, this isn't to me like inventing something. It's not you know, selling something on QVC or anything like that. To me, being innovative was about working within a very hierarchical, bureaucratic, policy-driven environment and how can I be successful and get after the things that I want to do. It may take some very creative thinking or uh, means to do something to get after a mission set or to get after the goals we want to achieve. It's, and it's important that you, you find a way to do that. I, I brought a couple books that I, I, I want to leave with you because oh, thank you. this has been part of my, my growth over the years. But um, this, this book, Orbiting the Giant Hairball, uh, by Gordon McKenzie. I don't know if you've ever seen No, I've not. So Gordon McKenzie was an employee of Hallmark just in Kansas City yeah. uh, for 30 years. And he wrote this really goofy book. Um, and funny enough, the chief of staff of the Air Force had this on his reading list. So I pulled it down and I'm like this is an amazing book it's to him he describes a hairball in an organization as each hair is another policy that you keep piling on and over years and years and years we keep piling on these things but we never take away so yeah. the hairball grows right your job as a person within an organization is to figure out how to stay in that right orbit you know because if you come in too brash too out of sync this and that the the system's going to eat you up. You're out of orbit and you're just going to float away. If you're in too close, you become part of that machine and and you're now not creating an environment where we need to think differently. We need to maybe be two degrees left to center to look at this differently, get a different perspective. If you're in nice orbit with it, you're able to to kind of work within this crazy bureaucracy because it's hard. Um, But I respect the bureaucracy because I do need it to a point, right? I, to get the things done, I still need my team, my leadership, my higher level leadership to get things done. But I may find a different crazy way to go get it done. You know, so I won't go too far, but I'll, I'll push the envelope. That's just the way I've always been. And I think a lot of my leaders would say that about me is that, yeah, Scott thinks differently. You know, he's just, he just does. And I think that's what makes me unique. I mean, that's feedback from that. Yeah. So what I love about that is that be present, be bold, be innovative. Um, you know, you, you mentioned it didn't come to you for 12 years, 12, 13, 14 years. And I think as humans, we go around, like you hear people talk about these missions and, you know, we have ours here on the back of the, the microphones, future greater yeah. than your past. Right. And I think we hear that and it's like, Oh, well, Brett, Brett just has had that forever or, or Scott's just had that forever. But I think it's, it comes with trial and error, yeah. but I also think it comes from, being present, right? 
being bold, I got to go out there and make things happen. And I, I got to go read books. I got to be a student of the game, but I have to action. be present. You got to take action. Yeah. Right. And then being innovative is always thinking of a different way to do something to your orbit you know, comments, right? Being And so when I hear those three words for you, it really hits me to, to all the people that are out there listening that maybe they're looking for that purpose or they're looking for that mission. I think sometimes it just hits you like a ton of bricks. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Um, matter of fact, the first leadership position um, as a young officer, you're kind of put in the first couple of years in the military, you're usually like just trying to, uh, learn your craft, be really good at your craft, but you're an officer. So you're still expected to lead, whether that's yourself, yep. whether that's five people, or it could be a couple hundred. Um, but, uh, when you get into a job called flight command, you might have a handful of people. Some flights are bigger. It just depends on the organization. And, uh, had a great leader who sat us down and he gave us this book called fish. Now this book's been around forever and it's about the, uh, Pike fish market, Pike street fish market out in Seattle. Okay. You know, if, if you ever seen them, they throw, oh, the yeah. Fish out. Yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of famous people have done it, but it's a, it's a story about that where there were four areas. And this is kind of where I got the presence from. It was the first one was choose your attitude. I, and I think you talk about that yeah. a lot, right? You, you got it regardless of what's going on. It's a choice. All right. So choose your attitude, be present, uh, make their day and play. So those were the kind of the first four criteria that a, a, a mentor kind of really laid into me that really resonated. And again, over time, I kind of, you know, morphed to my own maxims and, and things that I thought would be successful to me. But um, those four things, I think, are, are resonant within be present, be bold, be innovative. Yep. You can have fun within those. You've got to choose your attitude within those. You got to recognize people when they're being innovative or they found a different way to do a process when somebody was telling them, well, this is just the way we've always done it. Yeah. yeah. Which I hate yeah. that comment, by the oh, way. It's just the way it. we've always done it. Yeah. No, that didn't mean squat, man. It actually that's, motivates yeah. me to actually get under your skin. <laughs> right. You exactly. <laughs> now I'm going to do stuff that's going to make you mad. Yep. So, and yep. you said the choose attitude. I talk about that all the time. As you said, it's, it's really the top left pillar, if you will, of the circuits of success. But one of my favorite words in the dictionary um, is the word choice. And yeah. I'm a huge believer in choice, right? We choose our attitude. We choose our response to circumstances, whether good or bad, right? Yeah. We can do really, Absolutely. if you can get great news and can still go off the deep end. And they, they, where they say that people are most susceptible to failure after a major accomplishment. And so whether, yeah. whether we're winning a world series, we're retiring from a great career, you get that client out there. I always tell people, just be careful, right? Be careful. Yes. Do we want to celebrate? Yes. We want to be in the moment, but also then stay focused and make the choice to keep your eye on the ball because it can knock you off really, really quickly. Oh, so, so when you hear that word choice for you, what comes to mind? You know, I think it starts with how your day starts. You know, that's the moment that we get to control. Yep. Um, I think of the word control as well. I'm constantly trying to think about what are the things that I can control and what are the things that I'm not able to control? Because I think that's where almost turning yourself into a victim comes into play. You choose something you can't control and now you become a victim of it and you head down this bad path. And I think a, a lot of wellness coaches will talk about that. Um, you know, you do have a choice in so many things in this life. And, you know, when I talk to, to folks of, that are maybe having a tough time, we, we get into that spot of control what you can control and let's not worry about the things you can't. Um, you know, there are so many things that happen to all of us in this life. It, to me, it's a little bit of a stoic mentality. Yep. You know, uh, live your life as if you find out you're terminally ill tomorrow. How are you going to live today? You know, it, it's some people don't like thinking about maybe, you know, heading down that path, but, uh, we all do have an expiration date. You know, yep. that's something we can't control. So what I can control today is how am I going to live Wednesday? You know, what am I going to do this morning? Um, it may be just yard work today and that's okay. You know, um, you don't have to like everything either. You know, the circumstances, I'm not saying, you know, just be joyfully, gleefully all your life and nothing. I want. No, bad things happen to people all the time, but I think it's being able to recognize and understand and be able to manage what is happening, those emotions, 
And it's okay. It's okay to have a really crap day. Yeah. You know, it's okay that maybe it's a crap week, month, couple years. Um, but find ways that you can separate what you control and not control. And I think your choice will be a little bit easier to yeah. make. Yeah. So. so, so let's talk about that. So you did have that crap day, oh, right? Yeah. You've had that crap day <laughs> and you had it on a an couple ex- years. Yeah, yeah. So an extreme level that, that, that thankfully knock on wood, uh, I have, I have not had, um, but you had a bad day, right? And, and so kind of yeah. walk us through that. So just to give the listeners some perspective of what you've dealt with. So when they see this guy that's got great energy, great attitude, you know, full of all this wisdom, but what was the, the crap, right? Yeah. The stuff that you had to deal I, yeah, with. I, I think it'd be hard for people to see that I needed a walker a couple of years ago. Yeah. I couldn't see. I had an eye patch. I had pretty big, well, I have, still have a really big scar around my head. But um, yeah, in 2018, um, we were driving, my wife and I were, we lived in Spokane at the time. We were driving to a, um, uh, one of the unit holiday parties. Every unit has them every year. So okay. we were driving out to one and we got rear-ended um, at a stoplight. Not too bad, but I got some whiplash and and uh, through the process of them looking at the damage that had been done on my neck and, and uh, they, they did an MRI, of course, and an x-ray and all that. And the, this is the funny thing. I got a call as I'm... Um, sitting in a pre-op appointment for my wife who was going in for hip surgery. And I got a call from the flight doctor and he said, Hey, I got your MRI back. Do you know you have a brain tumor? And I'm like, mm. uh, no, I, I got to go because they're calling us back. You yeah. know, like I had no time to process that. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm here for my wife. I'm not here for me right now. You yeah. know? So I walked back, my wife had already been in the doctor. Can, can I pause you real quick yeah. on that? So yeah. just think of that, like have things happen, right? Like yeah. people I know call them God winks. I mean, so here's this, I got rear ended. Yeah. We can look at it, choice. We go back to the word oh, choice. Yeah. I right? was pissed about that. I was accident. pissed about yeah. that. But now <laughs> think about that. That might've saved your yeah. life. Cause well, would so you I, have gone in and got an MRI, right? No, I mean, most people in the military are generally healthy. Yeah. You know, and I think you would expect that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, we just don't get MRIs just to get MRIs, you know? Um, so yeah, I have no idea even to this day how long that brain tumor has been there. I know roughly the size. It was, it was about the size of a ping pong ball. Maybe just a little bit smaller. Mm. Um, which is big in the brain. Which is big. Anything in the brain, and though, not good. You know, that shouldn't yeah. be there. And it was deep. Um pushing up against my brainstem, your brainstem is supposed to be nice and kind of round and it was actually deforming it, but I had no symptoms to, to my knowledge. Now, I don't know if I was a bowling frog and maybe there were subtle ones. I just wasn't picking up on sure. it, but I had no clue. So we, when we got back in the car and we started talking about it, I just broke down. I was like, what does this mean? Like, I, I don't, I don't think I could even point to anyone in my life prior to that, that had one. So, so I'm like, who do I even talk to? And I'm the kind of person like, okay, let me find somebody that had one. Maybe you can provide, you know, yeah, yeah visual learner, right? Yeah. I need to understand a little bit, but I was lost. And, and not saying that when these things happen to you, you won't have the same reaction. I think that's expected. Um, but then you have choices still, right? So I could just play the victim for the next couple of years or however long I'm dealing this, or I could educate myself or, you know, I'm not going to just fake it. You know, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to accept it and then move forward. So I said, okay, next few steps here is we got to start seeing specialists, you know, cause they're going to ask for all kinds of MRIs and things like that. Um, I only had six more months left in Spokane and I already knew that I had been picked to be the commander here at Scott air force base in the summer of 2019. So I called my two-star leadership and my four-star leadership and certainly cried over the phone. I mean, sure, you know, they cry, you know, um, man, I'll get worked. Woo. Um, it takes you back. Um, they were so amazing. Yeah. Um, everything was, we're going to work through this. We, not you or it was, we'll work through this, you know? Yeah. And uh, I had a string of MRIs like almost every month 
um, I have this T-shirt that I bought that says, I've had so many MRIs, now I stick to the fridge. You know? <laughs> and, uh, I, I just bought that recently because yeah. I got another one coming right. up in October. But um, I've always tried to find at least some humor into this too because I think it helps me process a little bit better. Uh, of, oh, yeah. You know what? I can still choose how I'm going to act each day. I can still choose to show up to work. I still had to go back to work after hearing that news. I didn't get the day off, you know, and <laughs> I, I, could I have asked for it? Absolutely. Like that wasn't something my boss said, well, you're get to work. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I had a wonderful boss. Um, but I kept it very tight, a very tight circle around this because I started thinking who really needs to know this right now? Just a handful of people. Um, it doesn't affect anybody else, and um, there's nothing happening right now. Because you were still going on, nothing was, no symptoms, it wasn't like you had nothing, loss of balance, nothing, yeah, different things like flying, that. Okay. You know, yeah. up until that point. And um, then they put me under what's called do not fly status. So just until they could kind of see what was going on. I didn't know that that would probably be the last time I flew an airplane was in mm. you know, uh, winter time of 2018. But, um, I got into the simulator a couple times in the spring of 19 just because I'm like, I got to have my hands on something. I got, I still had to take a check ride, which is like a driver's exam every year that you got to get in. Uh, um, so I still took my check ride, you know, and passed. And, and, um, but again, those folks that were around me didn't know, you know, I wanted them to focus on our mission. I was the number two in command at that time, you know, so I was working for a wing commander. I had a responsibility in the organization, but I also knew that I could still, he gave me the, the space to take care of myself too. So, um, and then I instantly surrounded myself with the types of people that I needed. So like I started reaching out to that network of the optimisms, the ones that would hold me accountable for not making myself and turning myself into a victim. Mm -hmm. um, but the ones that would also be empathetic, right? So I think it's important that if you face something in your life, you, you look at the network that you have and start bringing those types of people that you would want to have in your life and bring them closer because they're going to provide the humor for you. They're going to provide the shoulder for you. They're going to provide just the ear for you. And, uh, and it was great. You know, there were times I needed somebody just to be sarcastic to me and, and make fun of me that I got a brain tumor, right? Yeah. It was actually a little bit comforting. You know? <laughs> um, so we, we went through this journey in Spokane. I arrived in late June here. I took command on the 25th of June in 2019. And then a week later, I had another MRI down at Barnes Jewish. And uh, so I had worked to get a, a, new, a new neurosurgeon here in St. Louis from Spokane and got referred to an incredible one. And, um, you know, one of the best cut men in the industry, is, <laughs> as his colleagues say, and uh, anytime I mention Dr. Shacoin's name, they're like, oh, he, he's one of the best, you know. <laughs> um, he's kind of the godfather from what I've uh, heard, you it's know. It's good to have that in the area. Oh, yeah. And it's great to have that type of capabilities around here. You know, it's not that far of a drive to go in, but, you know, my wife would go in or there are certain days where I could you know, just throw myself in. And But it, it reached a point in January of 2020 I'd had another MRI and the doctor said, Hey, this thing is growing and we may reach a point here where we're going to have to do something. And we had talked about surgery, gamma knife surgery, fractionated radiation. You know, there's, there's only so many things you can do, but I kind of had a lot of options here. Um, but we don't know how things would turn out after that. You know, there's, there's death. And did you know it wasn't yeah. cancer at that time? Or no. no. So it could have been cancer. It could have been benign. Yeah, you they couldn't do pathology okay. on it where it was located. You know, you'd have to do surgery to do sure. that. Um, so in 2020, in January of 2020, um, I started um, getting some numbness in my face, on the right side of my face. I started losing a little bit of dexterity on the left side of my body. Like something didn't feel right in my fingers. And uh, called the doctor and he's like, I, I think we need to make make a move here and he's like what would you like to do and i'm like what would i like you to tell do? me <laughs> but i tell you that was the process though because everybody's different right and so ultimately it is your choice surgery and i think it had grown too big for gamma knife so that we kind of took that one off the table or we could try radiation but the only true way i think to get after the pathology of this thing because i wanted to know 
what it was was to really do surgery. Yep. So, and I think with my health and my young age, you know, I was 45 at the time. Um, I was a good candidate for surgery. You know, if I was in my 60s, 70s, maybe not. Um, you know, and other other health conditions and things like that. But so we went into surgery in February 13th and um, of 2020. Of 2020. This is before all the pandemic and everything else. Like that's not even on my mind. Right no, now. I know that it's hit the coast of California and. You know, it's being talked about in the news, but, um, so a couple of days before that, uh, I had, a, had my, the mentor that gave me this book, book, uh, uh, General Holt, uh, who was at the Cardinals game, you know, okay, and, yeah. uh, he showed up and he was going to be there for blocking and tackling if something went bad, you know, that way my wife could just focus on taking care of herself and the family and, and he could deal with, you know, Air Force stuff and things like that. So he showed up. Flew in from Seattle. Um, we had a we had a great night. We went out for a drink the night before. You know, nothing too crazy. You, sure, I should say a couple nights before. I didn't drink the night before. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. No, for no, no, no. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was a couple nights before. Went and got my hair cut, shaved real tight. You know, and I still go into the same barber. She still <laughs> remembers that day. And uh, yeah, went in for surgery at five in the morning and. Uh, you know, you're there for like two hours and there's like a whole bunch of other people waiting for surgery. And, uh, and I wasn't scared until they start wheeling you back. I was like, okay. And then I got into the surgery room and there's like 10, 15 people in this room, massive surgery room, you know, just like you expect clean as can be. And, and, uh, and then there's this resident and she starts reading, Hey, this is Jeremiah Scott Heathman. 45 year old male. And all of a sudden I was totally cool. I was like, you know what? This is like a pre-mission brief. I've yeah. been through this. She's doing it's not their first radio. Yeah, yeah. I've gone through thousands of sorties of flying and you always do a pre-mission brief. Here's, here's what we're doing today. Here's the weather. Here's who we're going to meet or here's the cargo we got. You know, here's the sequence. She's laid it all out. I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, I felt like I was part That's of the what crew. I do. Yeah. yeah, you know, and then the anesthesiologist puts the, the the mask on, and they turn me over my left side, and and I remember saying two things to him, and then it was, and then in, lights I don't out. Remember anything? I said, um, whatever you do, don't take out my movie quotes. I've memorized a lot of them, <laughs> and I remember telling everybody because a couple of the residents came in and the doctors came in, and they said this was a great quote. You said, I said, I want everybody to do real good. <laughs> just do real good do real good and, and I, I was gone like within 30 seconds and and it was 10 and a half hours oh my hour goodness surgery. yeah so my wife is getting a call every 45 minutes for 10 and a half hours so and uh it went pretty good they got a, a good portion of it out there's a little bit just based on location they couldn't get i ended up losing my hearing on my right side because there was some tumor wrapped around the blood supply uh, I still, to this day, cannot feel, if you draw a line down the sh center of my face, most of this side. Like, I have... So you touch that, you don't know you're touching it. This feels kind of dead. This feels like numbness, Novocaine, all day long. Okay. Um, like, on a pain scale, to me, it's like a three, but you might say it's like a six or a seven. Yeah. Like it's nerve pain. These nerves are huge in your face. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and they heal very slowly. And... Um, I can't chew in that side because I can't feel my teeth. I can't feel half my tongue. I can't feel my nostrils. So you can COVID test me over here. And I'm good. <laughs> Show it all the way up there. Yeah. yeah. It's just, you know, some things I wasn't expecting, although we talked about some of this, it just, it just hit. Um, I couldn't walk hardly at all. You know, I could get up with a walker and needed help. Uh, I couldn't see, I had double vision. Mm. So right eye was a little bit off. Um, so the first couple of months I wore the eye patch cause it was just, it was really hard. Yeah. You know, I was reading like this and, um, so in the months to follow, um, you know, I, I came out of my command job and the number two, uh, rolled in to be the commander guy who, uh, you know, is a brother to me, Joe. And, uh, he'd been there before he, he, he had a three, three or four months stint as a commander cause we had a gap when I came in. Uh, so he just took over. I mean, that's what you do. You create an organization that something happens, the leader, yep. who, who can take care of, of the team. I didn't have any worries about that. I wondered, 
Uh, and they knew me well enough, so they took away my computer, my work phone. You know, <laughs> um, they didn't want any distractions. They wanted me to focus. But leading up to that, I did call. Leading up to surgery, I did call someone who had been through a, a brain surgery, a little different. And I said, "How did you manage communication, like with your team? Like, when did you tell your team? Because I even with my team at Scott, I had not told." really anybody but my closest commanders about it. Right. Um, and that was five of them. And then our vice commanders, so that makes six total. Um, I didn't tell our squadron commanders until about a week prior. And I just said, hey, I just want you focused on your people and the mission. I'm going to be fine. Um, prayers are good. Love and support's great. Send it my way. I could use it, you know. Yeah. But, you know, of course it was, Oh, that was an awful conversation. Just, it was emotional. Yeah. You know? But uh, oh, it, the outpouring was just incredible. You know, even though I couldn't see, I couldn't hardly yeah. talk, you know, it was just, there were so many things. But you have a choice. Again, are you going to play the victim card and say, Poor me. why me every yeah. day? Now, not to say that I didn't ask that question. I think... Anybody in that situation would say that. An athlete that goes down for a life or a year-long injury might say, why me? Yeah. You know, I, I absolutely expect that reaction. But the really good ones don't stay there yeah. that long. They move through it. Can I, can I ask a question? So, what, so I, I hear that, right? And that sounds easy. To say, I'm not going to say why me, and I have a choice, yeah, and it's hard. people can sit here driving down, like, all right, well, these guys are talking about choices, it, but yeah. but it's hard, right? You're yeah. dealing with just terrible stuff, and so what was it like when it's you, it, it's Scott Heathman sitting in a bed by himself, and the dark thoughts come in, right? How did you get through the dark thoughts to the positive thoughts? I always tried to learn something. Um, like I actually was trying to read pretty early on, you know, I, even when I was in the ICU, you know, I was able to get to a point where I could text some people and things like that. But, um, I always try to go to a place of learning, like again, just being curious, like I can sit here with this thought, but I don't want this thought because this makes me uncomfortable. So let's just go somewhere where I can go learn something. Um, and, and this book, funny enough, this was the first book I read when I could, you know, I was holding it up like this, you know, and, and, you know, page by page looking at it. It took me forever to read. I used to be a really fast reader and now it's, it takes me a little bit longer. <laughs> um, you know, th this is an interesting book This keep going because it's about how an artist deals with the monotony of, you know, create something and then they do and now they got to do it again. Yeah. Again, how do you keep going when bad things happen, when you hit a block in your life and this and that? He's got like 10 different things that he talks about in here and just, you know, just different things. One of them is every day is Groundhog Day. How do you, I was about to hit my Groundhog Day where I'm literally sitting, I'm going to have to wake up, go downstairs, sit in a chair, probably take two or three naps today. I would love to be able to get out and walk, but I just don't feel like it today. Um, how do you deal with that Groundhog Day? I like to go learn something. I like to watch something that maybe makes me laugh. I like to listen to music that doesn't depress me, but I listen to a lot of public enemy. Funny enough, <laughs> you know, I went to my old school rap. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, you know, I just, I found a new love of things that I had loved before, but maybe more intently paid attention to it. And that's, I knew even with the pandemic going on, that's the furthest thing from my mind. Like I got to just kind of sit with myself and get centered again. And, and it's incredibly hard, but the best thing to do is go learn from others, whether that's watching, listening to a podcast, watching a video, uh, maybe making a phone call to somebody. Uh, I got into meditation, which I'd never Strong. really done a lot wasn't disciplined enough to do it. You know, I'm kind of a... It was hard. hard for me to hold my attention. This forced me to hold my attention for once. And uh, it humbled me, too, because I'm all thrust, 
you know, sometimes a lot of, you know, good yeah. vectors here and yeah. there. Um, I, I move a, pretty fast and um, I'm motivated to do things and get after action. But this, for the first time in my life, slowed me down enough to just appreciate it. It was almost like the, uh, the Ferris Bueller moment, right? Because it might pass you by. Yeah. So just enjoy. I started enjoying the things that I took for granted. A walk. So how, how do you do that though? If you haven't, if you didn't get that little knock, right? That that major surgery, and you were forced to slow down to yeah. do that. Because a lot of us, thankfully, right, aren't forced to do that. Yeah. So how do you? Th- and maybe it's hard to answer. I don't know because you were forced to do it. But but looking back, if you could go back to 2017, 2015, that Scott. Yeah. How could I have offered that? To yeah. Myself? How could you have offered that to yourself then when you didn't know what you know now? I think it would have been incredibly hard um, to figure this out because I'll just say right up front. I think we all need life coaches. Yeah. Like I, I wish everybody had a coach. I agree. And, not a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, spouse, mom or dad. I, I'm just, I'm talking about a third party perspective that can listen and ask you very tough questions that you probably haven't asked yourself yet. I'm not talking about a psychologist necessarily either, but just somebody who can maybe ask beautiful questions that you probably haven't really spent some time with before and then get after these things. Um, and that's hard. So you know, we say a lot to people like, oh, go find a mentor. That's incredibly hard to find a mentor. And that's a tough phrase to say to somebody. But I think where you can start is with peers. And, and I think a lot of people look at peers as competitors. Um, airmen look at peers. Everybody's trying to get to that yep. next promotion, right? There's competition in everything. But there's also a lot that a peer can do for you. Uh, especially somebody that has a completely different perspective than you, maybe a different upbringing, maybe a different culture, maybe a different demographic, whatever it may be. Um, some of the best mentors thought I was their mentor, but they're actually mentoring me, you know? Um, that's, I, I have a couple airmen where I'm like, and I tell them this, I'm like, you guys have no clue. You guys are mentoring me. I'm not the one mentoring <laughs> you. Uh, so it, it really is amazing to see where these superpowers from peers and others can actually invade your life in a positive way. Right. You know, and I think that's where I would start is through peer group. Maybe it's a church group. Maybe it's a uh, volunteering together. Uh, you know, go to a non-traditional entity outside of work where you can maybe find some perspective. Yeah, and I'm a big believer in, I, I, it's actually funny, I think you're reading my notes here, I wrote down support system and mentors versus coaches. Yeah. Because I think there's a difference. There in, is a difference. That support system is my support system at home. I know I've got my support system at yeah. home. My wife is my rock. She's there. She, she supports me. She challenges me. There's that. Then there's mentors, people I can learn from, right? whether it's books I read or podcasts I listen to or just people that I know that I can, hey, I got questions, man, on this, right? Yeah. Never think I know it. But then there's the level that I've had for years of coaching. I physically put my money where my mouth is. I hire that person to not tell me what I need to hear, but to tell me what I, or tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear, right? And I think that there's a big difference in that. And if you look at the best athletes in the world or the biggest business leaders in the world, they have that person in their corner that they're paying money for that's there for them. And it doesn't always have to be someone that is... Like in my world, a, a superior, you know, to me, you know, I would look for a general officer. No, it, it, it could be somebody lower ranking than yeah. you if you're going to use a hierarchical type structure. Um, yeah, I do think there is a difference because, you know, a coach may be looking to guide you a little bit more towards a vision that you're trying to get to. And that maybe not necessarily dealing with a, a personal situation, a medical situation like I described here. Um but I also had to kind of put myself in perspective that, look, I'm just one story, you know, and, and I think that's why I decided to be a little bit more public about what, what happened. Maybe my brain tumor to somebody, it's the loss of a, of a boyfriend, girlfriend, an 18 year old who thinks that's the end of their world. So you do have to put things in perspective. And I, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, well, yeah, we should feel bad for him. He just went through brain surgery. You know, my situation in life isn't nowhere near as tragic it might be because that's all you've experienced at this point so i don't think i never wanted to get into a situation where people are starting to compare injuries with each other like well 
Mine's mine. worse it's, than yeah, yours. Yeah. It's like in Jaws, looking yeah. at all the scars, you know? Um, no, it's not about that. But as, a, as the senior leader, as the commander of an Air Force base, I had a very unique opportunity to show them I'm vulnerable too. Mm. I mean, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah. And you cannot... You cannot generate trust like you can with a vulnerable leader. Yeah. Like you should be vulnerable enough to walk into a meeting someday and say, you know what? I am, I just want to let everybody know I am off my game today. I, I do want to have this meeting, but if I'm quieter than normal, don't take this personal. I, I'm just off. I'm okay though. Or I might need a, uh, we might need to do some putt putt golf today, just yeah. later in the day. Just I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. But go through your day. Just by saying that nugget, you now have taken down the walls. The conspiracy theories are going away about what's happening with you, and they now see you as human, not a CEO, as a wing yeah. commander, as a. And for the first time, they go, Ah, they have things going on in their life too. They are human. They're human. Of course we are, but we tend to forget that. When yeah, I think it's ranks. Do you think as men too? I think sometimes we want to be that tough guy, and yeah, and then, so I'm raising you know my wife and I. We have four yeah. boys, and it's like I want my boys to understand that it's okay to be transparent. It's okay yeah. to be vulnerable. It's okay to have weaknesses and and, and share those things. You know, I, I share Absolutely. Uh, which I'm sure off off podcast you could help me with. My you know my weakness was this fear uh, of flying that, that manifested in anxieties and just different things that I dealt with for years. I mean, I went eight years without flying and just flew just last month for the first time. Really? And I'm talking to a guy that's flown, you know, a million yeah. times, a billion <laughs> miles. And, uh, let's go fly sometime. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I got to get used to, I'm, I'm getting on another airplane on Monday, yeah. but, uh, you know, so you got to get used to that. But I, but again, I think, I always struggle with, well, I can't share that. Um, you know, I'm tough. I'm this leader. But I found the more I shared my, my airplane, my anxiety, the more a person across the table me would share their thing, right? Yeah. That whatever their airplane was, they would share that. Yeah. And I think those words, transparency and, vulnerab transparency and vulnerability, are huge. I think they are. It, I'm, I'm a Patriots fan. I'm, that's hard to say in this region of the No, the I, I, Hey, I'm a Tom Brady guy, so it may be Good. hard for you. I'm a big Tom Brady guy. It's been interesting to watch how he's been given a little bit more ability to be open, yeah. and the vulnerability is coming out. Yeah. But I, you know what? He's always been that way, though. This, this didn't happen overnight. Yeah. But when you I'm watch, curious what he's, what he's walked away from right now. What, what are these personal reasons he's left the team for is what I want to know. Yeah, but you know what? I don't care. <laughs> like we all have these things, right. right? So why is it our business? But uh, you it's know, not. Yeah, but we like to think. Yeah, like, what's what's the Still greatest doing. athlete in the world? Yeah. You know, doing. Um, but it was fun to watch his series. And hey, look, whether you love or hate Tom Brady, you got to respect the guy being right. honest about what was going on. I mean, I think he I think he killed a lot of sports writer stories with that series, and I think he wanted to do that. I think he reached a point where he's been wanting to do this for a while. And this was a great outlet for yeah. him. And I think he did it with a lot of respect. Um, he didn't pull punches when he didn't have to, no. you know. But, you know, so I just, I respect that. I, I, I'm looking forward to watching the Jeter one, too. I think the Jeter one's yeah. probably pretty good. Um, I, I do like these kind of myopic pieces because I think this is when they're at their most vulnerable. And, and, um, we're getting to go in the brain of one of the, you know, I mean, yeah. arguably the greatest athlete, like you said, of all time. Yes. And what made them tick? It's incredible. Yeah. If you, if you at least just see behind the scenes a little bit, I like to say below the waterline, right? The yeah. iceberg, right? We all judge, judge each other on the 10% we yeah. see. And boy, if you could get just a little bit below that iceberg, that's the leaders I actually appreciated the most. I mean, think you got so, the Jordan one, you get the Brady one, oh, now you got the, the Jeter ones. one. It yeah. was incredible. I don't know Who, who's next. Michael Phelps. I'd like to see a Michael Phelps Ooh, one. Michael Phelps would be, be good. Be good. Um, I mean, he's gosh. the goat, right? I mean, think yeah. of eighteen or medals or whatever Gretzky. he's got. Wayne Gretzky would be awesome. You know, he's a pretty. He seems to be a pretty private. I yeah. Know him, but you yeah, know, right. Um, I, you know, it's killing me. You know, as I'm going through everything with the brain surgery and some, um, it's, it's he escapes my mind now. The St. Louis Blues player who went down with a with a injury last two years ago, three years ago. I don't know the blues well enough. Um, I, 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 Tarasenko or? 
I'm we'll add it to no the show notes. No disrespect to Blues fans. But <laughs> exactly. We're just going to get murdered by he the... He had this like fluke injury, and uh, I'm going to look him up again because, again, I, I, my short-term memory is a little off due to some of the meds I'm on. But he went down with a, with a kind of a life-threatening injury, which pulled him out of the game. And I thought about him, honestly. I'm like, you know what? I would love to just sit down and talk with him and share stories of how he dealt with it. You know, because when you look at, again, Tom Brady going down with a season-ending injury... Where I felt was like, yeah, I, I wanted to be with my team. I felt like I let them down. And that's such an awful thing to say about yourself. Right. right. Um, some people would say, oh, that's a little bit selfish. No, I don't look at it that way. I just viewed it as this is my responsibility to go down as the leader. I'm not supposed to do that. You know, yeah. and just like any great quarterback, I want to be back in that game. Yeah. And so after the surgery... You know, I literally was in a walker eye patch, you know, uh, the eye patch, I look kind of cool, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I just started off with a walker and, um, and funny enough. So I, you know, I briefly talked about my wife, you know, when she was going to have hip surgery in January of 2019, she actually had a full hip replacement in November oh my gosh. of 19. So before my surgery, she had a full hip replacement and healed up enough to the point where Okay, my turn now. You know, I'm yeah. going under. Um, and so she's, you know, she, my mom, you know, um, friends would be out there walking with me. Um, and little by little, finally got rid of that walker, got the cane. And my vision started to get a little bit clearer. Um, it was clear when I looked straight up, but it was blurry when I looked sh- straight out. It started to come down, and, and I saw a couple eye experts, and they said, it's going to be okay. It's going to come back into alignment. About four months later, it did. So right now, you and I are looking at each other. Yep, I, we're good. I've had a couple prescription changes, but I don't. I didn't have to get any prisms and things like that yeah. to really. Adjust. And did you wear glasses before? I did. Okay. Yep. Yep. So pretty normal there. Uh, periphery, I'm good. Uh, like I said, don't have any hearing on this side. Uh, vestibular is a little shaky at times. Um, but that was to be expected with all the ear work the ENT doctor had to do when they were. They had me open and because uh, he had to make some room for the neurosurgeon to get after that tumor. And then once we did the pathology, on it, they said no cancer, but it's a, an, it's an aggressive growing tumor. So we got to really watch it. And, uh, and they couldn't get it all. You know, they got it like 80% of it. They said, you know, we would like to go after the rest of this with radiation. So, here, I, I get done with surgery. I was had a surgery on the 13th of February, out of the hospital on the 16th of February. Um, you know, spent the next two months you know, getting my feet back underneath me a little bit. Uh, a lot of occupational therapy right over here. Mm-hmm. Occupational, physical, speech. Um, luckily, a lot of that came back. I feel like I slur. Like I, it feels like there's a mm-hmm. tennis ball in my mouth or like it's my face is sliding off. But I know... See, yeah, I would have no idea. I look fairly normal, yeah. I guess, if whatever normal yeah, is. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Uh, but I knew that I was going to go down this path of radiation. I'm like, oh, here's another battle. All right, you got to gear up. And so I started, I actually got to a point where I was running again. You know, about July time frame, I started jogging. Wow. Just, and I actually took a practice uh, physical therapy test just to see if I could do it. You know, sit ups, push ups, sure. and run. I'm like, okay, I think I could pass this now. <laughs> I didn't run a straight line. Yeah, you know, I was kind of <laughs> all over the place, and you know, but I stayed in my lane pretty good. And, and uh, but it was just me. I'd go there on a Saturday, and or I'd walk on the soccer field. I'd do some balance exercises and and things like that that they taught me to do. And but it was hard. It was really hard. But I knew in August time frame I'd need to go back into radiation. So August 10th, I started radiation. And what that encompassed was 30 rounds. August 10th, as of last year, or uh, as in uh, like seven days? Okay, 2020, 2020. yeah. Yeah. So six months after the surgery. Healed up enough to go back down to St. Louis. So I drove every day back and forth to the Sightman Center down, yeah. downtown St. Louis. Uh, see my buddy Lamont, who checks you in, and he's a huge Cardinals fan. Um, but, boy, you couldn't ask for anybody better at that front desk just to get you a high five because when you go in that waiting area you're there with people who are terminal people are getting chemo on top of reading i mean you're, you're now the customer yeah. you see the bell gotta ring the bell yep. 
So where are you at today? So what, what is, uh, so as we fast forward to yeah, that? Yeah, went through the radiation. Um, that, you know, radiation is not a good thing. It does damage to good cells too. So I think that kind of hurts some things in the face and that. But, you know, I, I knew that was a possibility. You're going to you gotta now manage what you got. You know, I, I stopped long ago trying to get back to my pre-surgery normal and say, you know what, this isn't about pre-surgery normal anymore. It's about living life what you got now. New normal. Yeah, it's a little different. Brain's rewiring itself and healing and doing good. So, so far, they haven't seen any growth. So I'll go, I'm now doing about every nine months. Um, they've been extended from six months to nine months, which is a good thing. That's great. Yep. So I'll go down and get another picture taken, meet with everybody. Um, I'll stay with the neurologist too to kind of help see if, how we can manage the pain. And um, But doing good. Um you know, I don't want to say like that was the only reason why I decided to retire. I, I think it was a big reason um, because I wanted to make sure that I'm I'm able to center myself a little bit more. Also, be there for my family. We had moved every year, every two years for the last decade plus. Um, I've got a special needs kid who's on the autism spectrum. You know, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to move him again. And you got to think about that. He's a old is he? Okay. Yeah, he's a senior this year at Mascuda. Yep. Um, this is the longest school system he's ever been in, ever. You know, two years up to the, that point was the longest time he'd spent in any school. And, and a lot of times it was just a year because we were oh, moving. Yeah. And, uh, and I think he, he's looking at college at Webster. He wants to get into film and that. And I'm like, I want to be around for that, yeah. you know, and have that time and freedom. So, um, so I decided, what can I be doing after the military? Well, my love and passion, my why is to elevate others like I, I, that's where my joy is right. you know so create but you have 25 years that. of showing that because that's what got you to be a commander at Absolutely. one of the largest air force bases in the country yeah i, I right. love is elevating others here. i love this community um i love the fact that we get to stay here and uh bought a house in shiloh and we're just yeah. we're loving this and we're just right down the road yeah. but it's been uh i wouldn't have wanted any other way Awesome. No regrets. Well, here, here's my takeaways, man. You got, you got, you got things, right? You got these big bags where people yeah. talk about carrying these bags, these, whether you call them your skeletons, whatever these things in your closet, but you've got these bags that you carry around with you. And it's amazing to me that I hope the listeners can hear from this incredible story that you've got all these reasons why you can have a victim attitude, right? All the things you got to deal with in your life. And, and you've chosen, go back to that word, right? You've chosen to not do that. And I think that's just shows you the power of the human body. I mean, I think, think about what you've dealt with, right? Literally yeah. your sight has come back. You've cut your head open and gone into your brain. And I mean, yeah, it's I just amazing the, it's the amazing, power yeah. that we have, right? That we, sometimes we just let it sit on the shelf yeah. and we don't go do anything with it. And it's, it's truly amazing. It, it really is. Yeah. And so that, that's what I would just, you know, try to, to challenge people and, and, and leave with people today is just, Man, we've got this amazing world we live in. And, and, and if we can turn this crap off, right? Turn off if those people aren't watching, but turn off your cell phone of the notifications and, and yeah. turn off these TVs and, and stop getting all the crap that's absolutely dealt to us every single day and start thinking about the things that we're grateful for, um, the, the, the personal mission that we can have and how strong our bodies really are. But it comes back to us taking the choice and taking the action to go do something about it. Well, you, and that's you, what you've done. You got to believe in it, right? Yeah, there you, you go, baby. It, Teddy right? Lasso. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I, <laughs> I love Ted Lasso. Yeah. You know, but you do. You have to believe in it. There are so many people working against you that are on social media. or new. I'm yeah. going to surround myself with the right things yep. and making the positive deposits and get rid of that negative side. Um, it's still going to be there, but I'm going to make sure that I'm not in a debit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be in the credit on the that's other right. side. So, I'm into that. You know, that's, that's the key, I think, right there. Is, and I didn't do it alone. So when you, you cannot do all this alone. You've got to surround yourself with some people. And if you don't know where to go, start at home. Start with a caretaker. Start with a best friend from college you haven't talked to yeah. in 10 years. Reach out. You know, reach out. Yep. You know? And there's so much help out there. Sometimes the menu is a little too big. I think people get little flabbergasted by oh my gosh it's so much help mental health help and this yeah. and that keep it simple just keep it simple and um and there's a lot of services out there that are free 
And um, this is somebody that can listen, a professional. Yep. You need to start there. I'm fully on board with that kind of stuff. Love so. it. Well, uh, Colonel Scott uh, Heathman, where can we find more of you, man? Are you on social media? You got websites? Yeah, where you at? I mean, so most, most of the things you can look up, just J. Scott Heathman. Uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. You'll find me on Facebook. Uh, like I said, I'm just starting a business called Elevating Others. So elevating-others.com. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, you'll find me out there. Like I said, I'm trying to grow this next venture and, and, uh, I'm loving the process. Love it, know? man. Well, uh, thank you so much one for being here today, but thank you for 25 years of your service. And thank I think I, I would like to end with one more thing. You had a pretty cool day. Those that can't see, well, maybe on this camera right here, we can see that Cardinal hat on the right. It's got my boy, Jason Isringhausen on there. Yeah. And you had a pretty cool experience with Jason, didn't you? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the surprise squad, the KMOV surprise squad. And, you know, they Which is the out. Channel 4 News here locally in oh St. Louis. Gosh. Yeah, it was, uh, I didn't expect it. It was completely unexpected. They got me. That's hard to do. They surprised me. And, uh, yeah, Jason came out. He, you know, delivered a baseball and said, hey, you're going to go throw out the first pitch. And it was the first game the Cardinals had uh, under the pandemic where they finally let people back in. Wow. And, uh, yeah, they flew in uh, um, one of my mentors and threw a strike. It was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to throw a, a ball like no. Penny Cent or, you <laughs> yeah. know. I watched all those videos because I was like, I am – I'm going to show this team. I can That's throw right. this baseball. But uh, yeah, it was just a beautiful day. And, and uh, Paul Goldschmidt gave me an, a beautiful message. I was just sad. I never got to like meet that. It was still under COVID, you know, yeah. the pandemic. And I, I would have loved to have just said thank you to him again, but at some point, you know, we'll, Maybe we'll find out. That's a way, right. But, we will, uh, we'll make that happen, man. <laughs> we, we will uh, either go grab that. lunch or if you're a golfer, you golf. You know, swinging a club is a little, a little tough right for now. Me. All yeah. right. Well, maybe we'll we'll, we'll go grab know, a off, so, yeah. yeah yeah. And we'll go yeah. grab a drink. We'll bring Izzy along and we'll uh, make it happen. Bourbon man. anytime. So, that's yeah. right. Let's yeah. do it. Well, again, man, thanks so much for being with us on the Circuit of Success. Tons of takeaways today for me and I know for our listeners as well. And just appreciate you and your service, man. Thank you, Brett. Thank you for having me here today.